Hey guys, welcome back. Um, just a couple of things I want to talk to you about uh, before we hear from Joel Rosenberg. Uh, a week from today, which would be May 19th at 7 o'clock, I want to invite all of you to come uh, to a prayer meeting in the parking lot. And we're going to have some praise music. We're going to have a testimony or two. Uh, I'll say a word or two. Not going to be long about that at all. But just a time for us to gather back at the uh, facility where we worship the Lord together. And so that'll be next Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And uh, you bring your lawn chairs, uh, bring something to sit on. We'll keep social distancing. Uh, you park around the, the, the area here and make your way over to the front of the children's department. Uh, and uh, you'll see where the drop-off is there at the kids' department. That's where we're going to set up the staging, and all in front of that will be an area where we can just sit down outside, worship the Lord together for a few minutes, and encourage one another uh, with praise and worship. So that's next Tuesday evening, uh, May 19th at 7 o'clock. The second thing I want to just uh, say to you is, uh, in the next day or two, I want you to be looking for uh, a video coming from me that it will be describing our reopening, giving dates and times and events and circumstances that are going to uh, revolve around our opening day. And so uh, be looking for that. I'm going to be sending it uh, through social media, through our website, through email, into your house, and uh, we'll have that ready for you before the week is over. And uh, so keep that in mind. Right now, um, we're going to play off of the discussion from last night. Uh, Dr. Ron Lynch and I just sat around together. We talked about prophecy. We talked about end times. We talked about how this pandemic may or may not have fit into the scheme of things biblically. Uh, but the real authority that will speak into our life uh, about all of that, plus a whole lot more. You'll be talking about uh, the, the end times. You'll be talking about that great war out of the book of Ezekiel and, and, and just bringing everything into perspective with us uh, about prophecy and about the return of Jesus. And so I hope that you enjoy Joel Rosenberg, a great prophetic voice across the world, written tons of books. Hope that you've read some of them. They're amazing. Uh, but he's coming right now. Enjoy Joel Rosenberg. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg in uh, Jerusalem. And it's great to be with you all. I appreciate Pastor inviting me to speak to you, uh, both in the congregation uh, and, uh, and throughout uh, those webcasts, wherever it goes in the United States and North Carolina, and certainly around the world. It is a joy to be with you guys. I was actually supposed to be in North Carolina and the Outer Banks with uh, a discipleship team uh, that we have led for more than 20 years. And uh, it's, a, it's a discipleship retreat. And unfortunately, um, that got scuttled as so many things have. But uh, what a joy to be with you all in Indian Trail. And, uh, and I hope this is helpful. Pastors asked me to, to, uh, to share a number of things, uh, starting with looking at this whole COVID-19 crisis, the the pandemic uh, disease, infectious disease itself, and obviously the economic implications of it, which have been devastating, um, and try to look at that and see if it has any uh, prophetic significance. And so that's where I want to begin today. If you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 21? Luke chapter 21, as you know, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus was asked here in Jerusalem, where I am, my wife and kids are here. We uh, we've got four sons, by the way, uh, Caleb, Jacob, Jonah, and Noah. The oldest is married and is working in the States. Uh, he and his wife work in the States. Um, the next one uh, finished the Israeli army and is getting ready to go to, back to the States soon uh, to study at a Bible college in the fall. Uh, the third one is in Israeli special forces in the army here. And the uh, the fourth one is uh, is in uh, high school. So we've uh, it, it has been an interesting moment. As as for you, it's been an unprecedented moment. Nothing like this in our entire lives has ever happened. My wife and kids and I, you know, we were raising them in Washington D.C. 
just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and on 9-11, um, when the attacks happened, both in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania, that was the most dramatic moment in our personal lives, uh, in the life of our nation. Uh, really, you'd have to go back to Pearl Harbor for a sneak attack of that magnitude. And, um, and yet, even on that day, if you remember that, you'll remember that uh, the churches weren't closed. The churches were open. In fact, they were full in the, in the weeks uh, that followed, at least for a while. Um, restaurants were open. I mean, in Washington, we had troops on the streets. We had um, fighter jets flying overhead. We didn't have any commercial or private aviation overhead. We lived near uh, Washington Dulles Airport, so we were on a flight path. We normally saw just flights coming in all the time, but it was only fighter jets at that time. So it was a, it was a strange moment. Again, troops on the streets, anti-aircraft batteries on our bridges uh, surrounding Washington, D.C. We were really in wartime conditions, which we had never experienced. Um, but this is so much different from that. First of all, it's not a foreign enemy. It's an infectious disease. Uh, it is not just the United States, it's the entire world, um, and it is going on and on and is having devastating uh, economic implications. So is any of that um, evidence that we're in some prophetic moment? Well, let's look at Luke chapter 21. Jesus, as you recall, was asked here in Jerusalem uh, in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13 records that moment where Jesus and the disciples were on the Temple Mount, or not on the Temple Mount, sorry, they were on the Mount of Olives look, overlooking uh, the Second Temple. It was still there. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, Jesus was, of course, prophesying that it would be destroyed uh, not too long from then um, in, a, in a judgment. But at that moment, the disciples were asking Jesus as they were sitting on the Mount of Olives, when are you coming back? They didn't, I don't think, even fully understood that he was leaving, right? He kept saying, I'm going to be arrested and, and, and unfairly tried and, and, and convicted and crucified, and, but I will rise from the dead on the third day. And they still struggled with that. They didn't, they didn't want to believe it. They didn't understand it. They, didn't, they, didn't, they had this image of Jesus as the king, right? The king who was coming to reign to kick out the Romans, to, to set up the, the Israelite kingdom on earth and make all things right. And they did not understand that Jesus was supposed to be a suffering servant. But he kept saying, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, but I will come back again. And so they said, all right, well, what? give us one sign that will indicate that your return is near. Again, I'm not sure if they fully understood what they were asking, but I think the Holy Spirit prompted the question, and Jesus could have given a very Washington, D.C. answer, a political answer, you know, no comment, next question. Right? He could have avoided giving them a sign, but instead he gives them a whole list of signs, many of which we're familiar with, and they're recorded, as I say, Matthew 24, Luke 21, also uh, Mark 13. We see here Jesus says to them, uh, again, Luke 21, um, I'm starting to read in verse 10. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Then he, Jesus, continued saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes and in various, place, uh, uh, various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven and it, and it goes on. It talks about persecution and so many other things. There's quite a list that Jesus says. He says that this is not the end. This is the beginning of the end. This is the, these are the birth pangs. That's the phrase that Jesus uses. They, the birth pangs, meaning, right? Um, uh, and if you're familiar with having had a child or if you're a husband uh, uh, who, uh, you know, as a father, you know what you've been through or you've seen all this happen. The birth pains are a contraction and then a release, a contraction and a release. And as the moment of the, the moment that everyone's looking forward to the, the arrival, the delivery, when that when you're getting closer and closer to that moment that everyone is waiting for, the good moment after the pain, after the suffering, the contractions get harder, more intense, more painful. And the release period between contractions shrinks, okay? So as you're getting closer and closer to the moment that, that is good, the good news of delivery, of arrival, the contractions, 
contractions are getting harder and the release moments are getting shorter. Why is that the image that Jesus lays out for his disciples? Because he's saying a whole series of very bad things are going to happen as we get closer, as, as humanity gets closer to the return of Christ. The return of Christ, uh, specifically the, uh, the rapture, and then later the physical second coming to this city, to Jerusalem. I'm sitting in our backyard and we are about 15 minutes away uh, by drive, uh, by car, uh, to the, the, the place where a temple will one day be and where Jesus will one day reign. And uh, that's going to be pretty exciting. But in the meantime, Jesus is saying very bad things happen as we get closer to the thing that we want, to the good news, to the arrival, to the delivery, as it were. And as we get closer, the bad things are going to be worse and worse. And yet there will be a moment of release. Things will not seem so bad. Then there'll be another contraction, another birth pang. And if you look at the list, if you say wars, rumors of wars, well, the Middle East, certainly Israel has had so many uh, wars and terrors and uh, troubles. Just in the 72 years since the prophetic rebirth of the state of Israel, which itself is one of the signs, one of the reasons we know, you and I can be assured that we are living in the last days, that we're getting closer to the return of the Messiah, of the Lord Jesus Christ, is because of the rebirth of the state of Israel, right? The prophecies tell us in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and others, that what's going to happen? That Israel is going to be geopolitically reborn, resurrected uh, in the last days. Uh, Jesus himself refers to it a bit cryptically, admittedly, where he talks about the, uh, the fig tree, and the fig tree will blossom in the last days. And when that happens in the, in the context of all these other things that are happening, then you'll know that Jesus' hand is at the door, that he's right there, he's about to enter. Where, you know, that fig tree analogy is important, why? Because all throughout the Old Testament, the fig tree is a symbol, one of the symbols of the state of Israel, the nation of the Jewish people and and the Bible is saying, Jesus was saying, the prophets were saying, that when Israel blossoms again, when it becomes a country again, when Jews come back, as our family has, from all over the world to settle here and rebuild the ancient ruins uh, and make the deserts bloom, when those things start to happen, we are really getting close to the return of Christ. Now, that's exciting. It's exciting to me. I hope it's exciting to you, but let's keep it in context. When Jesus says near, when it's soon, that's been 72 years since Israel was prophetically reborn. So we have to try to adjust our understanding that Jesus says a whole series of things are going to happen, but we have to be careful. Yes, we have to believe that the return of Christ is getting closer and closer. We have to live that way walking in holiness, walking in prayer, uh, preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, living the gospel to our friends, to our neighbors, hope, giving everybody the chance to at least hear the gospel and make a decision either for Christ or against him and hoping that they'll make a decision to say yes, right? We're not coercing people, we're not forcing people. This isn't the inquisition. Uh, we're giving people the chance to hear how can they believe Paul said in Romans, uh, how can they believe unless they've heard the gospel? And how can, they how, can, how can they even hear the gospel unless somebody tells them? And how can somebody tell them unless they're sent to go tell them? And so uh, the rebirth of Israel is one of the signs, but so are wars. We had a war in 48, 1956, 1967, 1973, uh, 1982, uh, 1987, uh, and, and so forth. And we've had... Uh, we We've had multiple rocket wars just since I've been here, not to mention all kinds of terror. So these things will all be happening as we get closer to the return of Christ. But tucked in here in this list in Luke 21 is the word plagues. And what are plagues? Plagues uh, are most often used in the Bible to describe infectious diseases. Now, they can be used in other contexts. In fact, I did a 12-page uh, fact sheet on how God uses pestilences, that's another word for infectious diseases, 
plagues and pandemics in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And if that study would be useful to you, you can go to um, the website of the ministry that my wife and I founded 16 years ago. It's called the Joshua Fund, uh, mobilizing Christians to love Israel and her neighbors, to bless Israel, <coughs> excuse me, and to invest in teaching the Bible. <coughs> including the prophecies, both to Israel and her neighbors, or Arab neighbors, Muslim neighbors, but also to the church worldwide. And so, for you know, free of charge, no problem. There's a PDF of the 12-page uh, fact sheet that you can find at JoshuaFund.com. <coughs> and I walk through. Excuse me, a little pollen in the air here in Israel as uh, spring, uh, spring sprung, uh, sprung. So anyway, the point is, God speaks of, Jesus speaks of infectious diseases, horrific plague, plagues, plural, spreading across the earth as one of the lists, one of the items on the list of the birth pangs. So again, plagues, pestilences, pandemics, uh, pandemics is a modern word, but these are, this is, this is a concept that Jesus says will be one of the birth pains, one of the terrible things that happens and sweeps across the earth as a sign, not that we're at the end, but that we're getting closer uh, to Christ's return. And uh, look, uh, you know, I realize this is a jump ball. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a judgment call. My assessment personally is that this is a birth pain. This is so huge. This is so sweeping. This is unprecedented. Um, that I think there's no other way to read it than this is one of the birth pangs. Now, the Joshua Fund, you'll also see, if you go to joshuafund.com, you'll also see that we did a national poll through a respected national polling firm. And one of the things we asked was, do you see this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and resulting economic um, you know, catastrophe, chaos, do you see that as... Uh, a sign of coming divine judgment? Do you see it as God using this as a wake-up call to, to shake people and get them back to God and, and to the Bible? Do you see it as both a sign of coming judgment and a wake-up call, a spiritual wake-up call? Or do you think that this is not connected to the Bible or prophecy or anything spiritual or divine at all? We gave people those choices, and amazingly, 44% of the American people said they believe this is a combination of uh, a sign of coming judgment and a wake-up call, and that's interesting. And you can look at those details. You can see what atheists believe and what agnostics believe and what Jewish people believe and others. All those things are broken down at the joshuafund.com site, and again, uh, free of charge, and you can look at those numbers. Those are interesting numbers. Well, we asked another co question. Do you believe that the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic chaos that has resulted, do you believe that this is a sign of what the Bible calls the last days? I would encourage you to look up that figure as well, because that's uh, approximately one out of three Americans believe this is a sign that we are living in the last days. Now, I'm one of those three, uh, one in three. Um, now, what's interesting is 40% of Jewish people believe that we're living in the last days. 50% of, uh, of African Americans believe that we're living in the last days. 40% of Hispanic Americans believe that we're living in the last days. Look at those numbers. They're fascinating. And, and, and so my answer is yes. I do believe that this is a wake-up call. I do believe that this is a sign that we're living in these birth pangs, that this is one of them. And I do believe that um, it is a sign of coming judgment, but I, I don't think we can draw the conclusion that this is judgment right now. Now it's bad, it's very bad, not just in the United States, but around the world. But I don't think I'm comfortable yet drawing a conclusion that it's judgment. I still think it's in, in the wake up call category. But let's be honest, the Bible is clear that judgment is coming to all nations. And when you think of the United States, I mean, that's a country, I was born and raised in the United States. Yes, I'm a dual U.S. Israeli citizen now, as, our, my, as is my family. We live here in Jerusalem, but we come back to uh, the United States a lot. It's a country that I was born in, raised in, where I came to Christ, where I grew, where I was discipled. 
And I've been praying for the United States for a great awakening among unbelievers and a great revival among believers for a long time. I wrote a nonfiction book in 2012 called Implosion. Can America recover from our economic and spiritual challenges in time? And one of the things I noted in that book, and I would just note to you now, just something to, to chew on, but when a country has murdered 60 million babies, and that's where we are now, we've, we've killed more than 60 million babies, do we really think that we can escape judgment? Uh, you know, think of 60 million babies that have been murdered, 60 million human beings, their lives have been taken just in my lifetime. I, I was born in 1967. This really began in 1973, the abortion industry that we know it now, which is so evil and it's so heartbreaking. And more than 60 million babies have been killed. Now, 60 million lives taken, that's 10 times more human beings murdered than the number of Jews murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust. Do we really think that we can escape judgment? We can't, let's just be honest. And we're not even talking about the pornography plague or you know, spousal abuse or child abuse or you know, all the other kind of sins and crimes that every country is engaged in and certainly the United States. We're just talking about abortion just to take it, just to put it in perspective. So I wanna be clear, even though it's not, it's not easy to say, it's very sobering, but judgment is coming. And I believe we're in a wake-up call. The type of judgment that the Bible describes in the book of Revelation, for example, we haven't seen anything like that. At that point, a third of the world is going to perish in these plagues. Okay, so we're not we're not anywhere close to that yet. But this is a moment to, as a believer, to make sure we're really walking with Christ, that we're not getting distracted by anything else. And if we don't yet know Christ, if you don't yet know Christ personally, if you're not yet born again, you haven't been adopted into God's family to go to heaven forever, to have your sins all forgiven, to be given God's righteousness, to have his hope, his peace, his wisdom uh, in this life, as well as in, you know, in spending eternity with him, then this would be the day to make a decision and receive Christ. So yes, I believe we're in a, in a, in a prophetic moment. Now, your pastor has also asked me a couple other questions, which I want to hit in, in sort of a, a little bit more in a lightning round scenario. He said, what recent events in the Middle East have raised your eyebrows and why? Uh, well, I think one of the things that's been so striking to me in, in recent years is in addition to war, I mean, we've had genocide, we had uh, the Islamic State, known as ISIS, right? was waging genocide against Christians um, and, and, and slaughtering many, many Muslims and uh, a religious group known as Yazidis and others. But this was happening in Iraq, it was happening in Syria, it was happening in this area, and actual genocide was underway here. ISIS was trying to eradicate Christianity in the Holy Land region. It was horrific. Now that's, that itself is over, and some of the worst wars of the last, say, 10 or 20 years, uh, since 9-11, let's say, uh, most of those have died down, mostly. Um, we still have, you know, birth pangs at times of, of terrorism and other uh, shocks of war. But we're also seeing things settle. And one of the things that's happening is that the Arab world is more and more Arab countries are starting to think, you know, maybe Israel isn't the problem in the region. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's an ally. Maybe it's part of the solution. Iran is being perceived as the threat of the Iranian regime, and Israel is being seen as part of the solution, part of the answer for peace and security and stability and prosperity in the region. I've been invited as an evangelical leader to bring delegations of evangelical leaders from the United States to meet multiple times with the president of Egypt, with the king of Jordan, with the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates. And twice now, I've led two delegations to meet with the crown prince of the, of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, some of these countries, this is the first time evangelical Christians have ever been invited to meet with their senior leadership. And actually in all of those countries except Jordan. And it's been fascinating. I, I don't, we don't have time to get into the conversation or to describe now what those, uh, those trips were all about. 
Uh, I'm actually working on a book on that right now. You can certainly Google um, me and evangelical leaders and Arab leaders, and you'll find out a lot um, that I've written about it and interviews I've done. But why, do, why is that significant? It's significant not because of what's going on with me personally, the, the doors that God is opening for me and my colleagues uh, as, as the head of Joshua Fund and as an evangelical leader. What's interesting is that we're getting to a place where most of the Arab countries are not willing to go to war against Israel and where others are actively considering maybe it's time to make historic peace treaties. That's significant, and it's significant, but it's encouraging, but it's also significant for the next question. Uh, three, is the battle of Ezekiel 38 near? That's which your third question on your pastor's list. In other words, this is known in Ezekiel 38 and 39, what Bible scholars call the War of Gog and Magog. Very short version of that. Again, I wrote a, 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 a nonfiction book called Epicenter about this in, in great detail, what this, this and other prophecies, uh, you know, what's happening and, and what do they mean, and, and you can get into the details there. Um, that's the non-fiction uh, book, Epicenter. There's also a, a novel version of what would happen for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to play out. We don't know exactly, but this was a fictionalized version in a book called The Ezekiel Option. But the short version is that Russia and Iran form an alliance to come against the reformed state of Israel in the last days, to consume us, to conquer us, to absorb us, uh, to wipe us off the, the map as, as we've known it. Now, what's interesting about that is that Russia and Iran, as you and I are having this, uh, this moment together, uh, Russia and Iran have been building an alliance, a strategic, military, political, economic alliance together. And it's the first time that they have done so in the almost 2,600 years since Ezekiel wrote that they would. Okay. In addition, a number of the other countries that are involved in the prophecy are also forming an alliance with Russia and Iran. Again, we don't have the time to get into it specifically, but some of the countries that are also cited as not being part of the coalition are showing moves towards peace with Israel. Egypt is not mentioned as being on the, the aggressor against Israel. It's not part of the coalition. And Egypt currently has a peace treaty with Israel and has since 1979. Iraq, known in the Bible as Babylon, Babel, Babylonia, Mesopotamia, Shinar. There's lots of biblical names for the country we know as Iraq. But Iraq, in all those names, are, is not mentioned as part of the coalition that will come against Israel in the last days, Ezekiel 38 and 39. It is not a friendly country towards Israel at the moment, but all of it, the war and troubles that it has had has neutralized its offensive capability. So we don't have some warm, cozy relationship right now between Israel and Iraq, but is Iraq is not a country that we are threatened by here in Israel. That's significant because this is the first moment, the first window in human history where Israel has been a country, you know, is a re reconstituted country, and where Iraq and Egypt are not threats. And when you go a little bit further and you look at that prophecy, you'll see that uh, uh, countries known as uh, Sheba and Dedan are also mentioned not as aggressors, but as going, hey, hey, what's going on? Why is this happening? Why are, Russia, why are you doing this? Now, Sheba and Dedan are Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. And I've written about that, again, extensively. But the point is, we're, I've sat with the leaders of Saudi Arabia. I'm the only Israeli citizen who has ever publicly met with the leaders of Saudi Arabia. They had me as an Israeli citizen come and meet the highest leaders in the country. Why? Because they don't see themselves in an aggressive posture anymore against Israel. And I think that's significant and something that we should be watching uh, closely. Finally, uh, your pastors asked me to just describe worldwide conditions that have biblical implications. Well, that could be a whole other, you know, that's a doctoral dissertation type question. Uh, generally, I would just go back to the point we made uh, at the beginning. When you look at Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and uh, Mark 13, and you look at the list of uh, the prophecies that Jesus said, watch for these. When you see this list, when you can go check, 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 when you can see these things happening again 
and again, and you know, they happen, they're a contraction, and then there's a release, a contraction and a release, a contraction and a release. Again, we, we mentioned before, look at the war just against Israel, 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, 1982, 1987, and then all the rocket wars that we've had in, in the last few years. I've only lived in the country six years with my family, and there was a war when we arrived. 4,200 rockets and missiles fired at Israel the very month that we arrived, August of 2014. So my point is, we are seeing wars. We are seeing rumors of wars. We have seen genocide in the region. We have seen uh, uh, revolutions. We've seen, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the Bible is talking here about uh, um, uh, insurrections and revolutions uh, in Matthew 24 and uh, Luke 21. We've seen the Arab Spring where, whole, you know, the country, the, the leaders of of, uh, of Iraq, um, of Libya, of Egypt, of other countries have been overthrown, right? This has all been happening. These birth pangs keep happening on a very um, steady rhythm. Um, but also Matthew 24, 14, the, this gospel of the kingdom, Jesus says, this good news, in the midst of the, the list of all the bad things that are happening, but all, there's two good things that are mentioned in the list. One, Israel will be reborn as a country. That's the parable of the fig tree. That's what we're seeing here. Israel's never been stronger, never more secure, never more prosperous. Yeah, we're having a hard time right now, as are you, but Israel's stronger than ever before. Uh, a regional superpower in many, many ways. That's extraordinary. That itself is evidence that end times Bible prophecy is coming to pass. And there's, so that's one of the positive things in this list of bad things that will be happening in the last days before Christ comes back. But there's one other, this Matthew 24, 14, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus is going to come and literally set up his physical kingdom on earth in Jerusalem right here in a rebuilt temple. Uh, there's no sign right now that a temple is ready to be rebuilt, but the Bible says it will be one day. All that's going to happen but first, the gospel has to be spread so that everybody in the world hears the gospel, has a chance to consider the gospel, and has a chance to say yes or no to Jesus, to receive him as the Messiah, as God, as the Christ, as the only way of salvation, or to reject him forever. And so I just want to wrap on this thought. Again, I mentioned this ministry that uh, my wife and I started uh, almost 14 years ago called the Joshua Fund. This is a ministry that uh, invests in the Messianic churches here in Israel of the Jewish people who are coming to faith in Christ, the Arab evangelical uh, congregations, and not just in Israel, but also in the Palestinian territories and in five neighboring Arab countries. We invest in the work of the church of strengthening the church and pre preaching the gospel and preaching the word of God in uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. And so it's Israel and her neighbors. God's love is for both. It's not either or. It's not either love Israel and hate the Arabs or love the Arabs and hate Israel. No, God's love is for both. And the Joshua Fund's ministry is to love both, to invest in the church on both sides of the border, as it were. And this is something that I am passionate about. Yes, I write novels. Uh, the Jerusalem Assassin is, is one of them, and about a Saudi-Israeli-American peace process, sort of evocative of what we've been talking about, the Jerusalem Assassin. But that's part of my life. The other part is mobilizing Christians, educating them, and then mobilizing them to do four things. Learn, pray, give, and go. Learn what God is doing? What is his heart for Israel and the neighbors? And be involved prayerfully, financially, and, and actively, practically in helping strengthen the church in this part of the world and making sure every Jew, every Arab, every person has a chance to at least hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. And the Joshua Fund, I guess from the, from the board and staff perspective, it's like we're a, a venture capital firm. We're investing in small uh, but, but, but wonderful ministries that need encouragement, need prayer, need financial support. From a donor perspective, uh, we're like a mutual fund. 
lots of people have a heart to reach, reach Jewish and Arab people with the gospel and strengthen the church in this part of the world. Praise God. But not everybody knows how to come here and vet all the ministries and know where to invest and how much and when and how to encourage and not just money, but with advice and training and uh, other practical support. That's what we do. And so if, if you were to be in, so moved, we would love to get you involved. You can learn more at joshuafund.com. Again, all the resources that I mentioned are there. Uh, we take trips to Israel. Uh, your pastor probably does too, so I hope you'll come with him. Uh, but, but you can learn about how to get involved and you know, at $25 a month or $50 a month or whatever, you can get involved and in being part of this. Because to me, this is a practical way to take the issue of prophecy and say, okay, how can I be involved in reaching this last frontier of the gospel for Christ. Thank you. It's been an honor to be with you. I may have gone a little bit over. I apologize for that. Uh, may God bless you. And I hope to see you all here in Jerusalem. If not in this side, <laughs> then certainly in the millennial kingdom, I look forward to having you. But, but I pray that you will not only be challenged by what we talked about today, but motivated. How are you supposed to live your life differently? How are you supposed to invest your time your talent and your treasure differently because of the things we talked about from the scriptures today. I'm Joel Rosenberg saying shalom and I love you from Jerusalem. God bless you.